Now we get a question a lot about how many stands should someone have on their property. And you know, really if you're setting it up, uh, no concern for money, then um, just concerned about where you need stands, where you have to have them. I wanted to go over some of the numbers that we look at with our land here in Minnesota that's much larger and then our land in Wisconsin that we hunt, which is a lot smaller. This kind of brought up because, you know, really clicked in my head, Dylan and I will talk, a lot of times I'm with a client, we're talking, Dylan and I, or I'm laying in bed at night, and I think of a video idea. And one of them was, uh, Dylan was at a property down in Illinois where they only had two stands on 70 acres. They were both more evening stands over food plots, they were blinds. That was it. And, uh, and it was designed by a habitat specialist and uh, really left this kind of like, you know, it's kind of eye-opening uh, what's really out there because that's a very poor design. And we'll talk about, we want to have stands for AM, PM, tweener stands for midday, and, uh, and, and really that stand assemblage. And that stand assemblage to me, in having defined morning stands, defined evening stands, is a way that you could tell if, you're, if your plan is really doing well or it really needs a lot of work. So when you go to a property, like in that case, with 70 acres, had two stands, there's a lot of work to be done. And Dylan, I think there was a lot of work to be done there. And to make sure that that client could actually hunt the property. And I think, Dylan, how many morning stands did you come up with? Uh, I'd have to look back, but I would say at least four or five. Yeah. And and so the, the client was very excited because he hadn't been hunting mornings or had really the ability to hunt mornings. So I know he'll have a lot more opportunity to hunt everything now. So we want to make sure that you apply some of these practices to yours. So it's, you can't really break down. I don't like numbers where you need a certain amount of acres of bedding per, per parcel, a certain number of acres of food plot per parcel. Because there's so many complexities that go into that. There could be open ground, open field, non-wooded habitat, brush habitat. So it really uh, changes. Plus, really depends on where the deer are moving. Maybe you have lots of uh, human movement around and outside of an area where you don't have as many stands. Maybe they're deeper areas that you can't access for whatever reason without spooking deer. So you really have a lot of factors. But in general, what we find is that on 40 acres, we usually find 8, 10, 12 different stand locations. and uh, But that same ratio can't be applied to larger parcels. And I wanted to use my the property in Wisconsin. I dotted them out where we have stands. It doesn't really matter where open field or anything. My, our property in Minnesota is very irregular. We have ag field right here, owned by someone else, ag field right here, ag field actually up here, ag field down here. <laughs> so we have a lot of ag field surrounding us. But the rest is pretty much woods and cover and edge. Sorry to interrupt, but we have a lot going on with this food plot and many more. I can't wait to plant this. Check out what we're planting on WHS Wildlife Blends. All 12 of our blends are out. You can order bulk seed, buckwheat, and rye. Check it out. We have a new website. Click on seed on the whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. It'll take you right to the, the new blend site. Appreciate you for checking it out and taking the time to watch us. Now on 40 acres in Wisconsin, we have nine stands. That's one stand for every 4.5 acres. But we can't take that and apply it to a uh, larger parcel. For example, if we had 450 acres, that doesn't mean that we're going to have 100 stands or whatever the math would, would work out to. On our 245 acres here in Minnesota, we have 26 stands. That's one per 9.5 acres. And that's what you see as the number of acres increases directly proportionate to, the, the, to this ratio right here the number of stands per acre decreases. And that's a ratio we see anywhere. Um, I, I've gone to properties that have 100 stands on 80 acres, and that's not necessarily a good thing because if you have that many, there's obviously areas, unless they're five feet apart in the right areas, there's obviously stands that are located in areas that are interior and probably shouldn't be used because we want to be able to set aside lots of acres. And I'll give you an example here. You can't really tell in here, but this area right here on our land which is a lot wider than it appears here, is all set aside. We don't go into this area, and it's probably a little bit wider than that, quite a bit wider, actually. So we have a lot of area we don't go into, and that's counting some uh, field edge, too. Back here, we have a lot of area, and you can't tell because of the terrain, some of these areas actually go down 300 feet in elevation, so you can't see the elevation here. But by and large, though, those dark areas represent... The areas that we have set aside that are areas that we don't enter during the deer season. We try not to blow our scent in there, let the deer hear us, 
or smell us, see us in those areas. So areas that are more contiguous, what I call holding cover sanctuary, and those areas also include our food plots. They're in the, within that mix too. So what bottom line is, you have a lot fewer stands as the number of acres increases. But again, you can't necessarily apply these. But I would say, Dylan, on, on a typical 200-acre piece that we see, we're around 20 stands. Would that yeah, be? I would, yeah, anywhere between 20 and 30, really. I mean, it depends on how much edge there is. Yeah. I think that, that's a big factor as well. And I would say when we look at 500 acres, the amount of stands uh, per acre drastically drops because I've seen a lot of 500-acre parcels, 400 acres, 600 acres that I've looked at that would be in that 25-stand range, um, you know, maybe 30. So it's not like you're doubling even it from 250. It, again, it's really... A uh, thousand acres, eight hundred acres. You might have forty stands, fifty, but um, certainly not the same ratio um, as, as that forty-acre parcel because we'd have four hundred and fifty stands on that thousand acres, and that's not. I think a lot of it comes down to um, you know, there's a lot of factors, but how many people are hunting the property, you know, you know what what their use of that property might be, and again, coming down to that lay of the land and edge. How many roads? How many access yeah. points? Where the cabins are? Where lakes? Our ponds are? There's there's so many different factors too. So one of the things that we can look at though are some common concepts when it comes to how many stands per acre and how many you should have and how that actually again reflects how high of a quality parcel design that you have. Two per 70 acres is bad. Um, you need to have more than that. So we'll look at number one, equal AM stands versus PM stands. We find that ratio to be pretty correct so that if we have 10 stands on a property, three or four are going to be more morning related, three or four are going to be more evening related, meaning they're closer to food, the morning stands are closer to bedding, and then you're going to have two or three that are in between. The two or three in between, those tweeners, represent more like 20% of the stands, not half of them. And that's why I say a lot of times you don't have a lot of all-day stand locations in a good parcel because you're going to want to sit one place in the morning that relates to bedding area. You're going to want to sit. You're going to want to sit another place in the afternoon, evening that relates to evening food source movements. Completely different locations. There's a few stands in between, like I said, but you're not going to have as many, and you might have more faith and, and feature more of a quality hunt for the entire day if you're maximizing prior, prioritizing the quality of your sit in the morning and the evening. So a lot of times a morning stand, for example, might be a great morning bedding area stand, but as the deer are leaving there in the afternoon going towards food, that stand can become a real dud in the afternoon. Even your best stands, some of them are morning stands, deer bucks move along around during daylight hours a lot more in the morning, but that stand can be a real dud in the afternoon. On the flip side, evening stand, you go there in the morning, if you go into that morning stand in the evening, or that evening stand in the morning by food, you spook out deer off the food source. It can be not only a dud in the morning because you spook deer going in, but now those deer don't go and pack in the afternoon because once you spook those deer out of a food source, they're not in their bedding areas either. That's the problem with spooking deer out of a food source. Those bedding areas that anchor that food source movement, or vice versa, once you spook out that food, those deer aren't going to be in those bedding areas. So critical that you don't spook out that food. The bottom line is that's why you need to have both. And again, those tweener stands represent about 20%. Those are some of those stands I'd consider for all day because it could be between that perfect X between food, bedding, bedding area in the morning, another bedding area, good food at night. You're kind of in that, that great zone. Those are some of our great waterhole stands where we look at, wow, we can hunt. I like finding because of the the time sometimes expense with a 300 gallon tank and effort to put in we really like finding a spot where we can hunt our water holes both in the morning and the evening so those represent some of those tweener stands a lot of our water holes now one of the things you want to consider you want to have stands for all winds a good design and it's rarely a property we go to that we can't find a way rarely and i'm talking out of you know again i've been to about 1400 parcels and it's very, very, very rare that I can't find, um, there's never a, a property you can't find morning and evening stands, and I'll say that again, never, but to have every wind associated with both morning and evening stands, that percentage of properties that feature morning, evening, and hunting for all winds, either morning or evening, the percentage that doesn't feature that would be extremely low. I would say less than 5%, it was probably less than 3%. I would say out of a property that I go to, um, 85 clients this year, and I've been to as many as 125, so let's just say 100 clients, 
literally it'd be two or three, four, five at the most that wouldn't feature all those things in one parcel. Dylan, you say that's pretty true yeah, for a yeah. ratio on yours. Very, very rare that we wouldn't find where it's, you have to hunt mornings and north winds and that's it. Oh, I've never had that happen. Yeah, no, and so that's what I mean. When you have a good property design, it gives you options. What do options mean? It means that any morning where there's a good cold front that goes through, where you have good winds, where you have time off, you can hunt. So what a shame if you only have a couple stands on a big par parcel and you can all hunt with this wind or that wind and they're only evening and they're only morning, whatever. And you're really severely limiting yourself. And I would say, you know, it's interesting. We get into some 20 acre parcels, we still have eight stands. So really a high amount of stands per acre, but it's because it's that smaller parcel. And again, it's reflective of that ratio. That's an ever decreasing amount of stands per acre as you have more stands. Number four, what happens if you don't use a stand? You know, we have, even right here, let's say we have 26 stands in our, in blinds in our, our home property here in Minnesota. Well, I'll find that there's some stands that I don't use in a year. For the most part, there's a reason why. Either I don't have confidence in the stand, I don't see the sign that I want to around that stand, or we're making, we've made habitat improvements, say expanding a, a food plot, so now this morning stand turns into too close to that food source, I don't feel confident going in there, I might spook deer. So we get those stands out, we move them. Dylan and I were just talking about yesterday, going around the farm here. Um, I think we thought of about five stands we need to pull, and we have spots for those five stands. We'll move them around, and uh, we can't wait to do so. We have a new redneck that's going right behind the house here that's gonna be on the first bench down below the house that we're going to have a water hole. We'll be able to watch that from 25 yards in a redneck, and. Uh, that would be like our home blind where we just want to get out and have a quick hunt. That's a tweener stand. It's in between big food, bedding. We can get into it safely just through the backyard here, and that'll be something we can just run out and hunt for a couple hours in the afternoon, evening if we have some time. And uh, I know we'll get a lot of use of that sprinkled out throughout the season. But bottom line, if we're not getting use out of the stand, I have uh, one stand set up that I'm thinking of right now that we didn't, haven't used for two years. There's another one I haven't sat in for two years. So I need to get rid of those and uh, move them somewhere else. Because that confidence or the change in habitat dictates that that stand needs to be somewhere else in use. So number five, hang on versus ladder versus blind. You know, really let the conditions dictate what we should be using. For example, we have some of our best blind locations are behind sumac, gray dogwood thickets, areas where we have low brush, where we can we don't have another choice for stand or blind, but we can actually hide that blind either at the top of the brush, behind the brush. We'll use big switchgrass banks. Big Rock Trees is coming out, and they've planted uh, hybrid willows, hybrid poplar, silky willow around the base so that it grows up into a clump around that blind. So we love our rednecks, but we want to hide them. And so when we look at areas that are kind of open, that we don't have good trees, but we can still brush that in or put it behind. We have another location this year, we put it behind a brush pile. The one we're adding down behind the house is behind a giant old white oak, you know, probably a 30 inch uh, diameter trunk down at the base. And so has a big expanse of branching out of different logs and trunks. And so we're gonna put that behind that so we could actually blend it in a little bit as best as we can. The bottom line is we wanna hide those. Now, when it comes to, I like ladder stands. I like the comfort of them um, with our uh, family tradition stands jack makes credible tower stands we have those two the ladder stands and hang-ons the hang-ons i tend to use in some of those pull uh, big tr mature timber areas where we have straight trunks we can get up if we don't have straight trunks for a lot of times we're using ladder stands if we have really good cover like some of our red cedar uh, trees we can use ladder stands big oak perfect for a ladder stand that has a lot of branches we can hide it in there so we can really let the uh, tree determine what kind of stand we're putting in there the type of habitat if it's going to be a blind we're putting jack's tower stands we usually have them behind a red cedar tree so we can cut it out and we can be hidden within that or we have we put material around it we put it next to a big trunk it's behind a log pile again it's kind of the same ideas as the redneck but they hide in just a little bit better though they're a little bit smaller if you look at it that way so and then, you know, we talk about tree saddles and private land. Very few of our clients will exclusively use tree saddles on a property. And it, and it goes, you know, you could apply that to a, a climbing stand just because of the effort and noise it takes to get set up in the morning when going into that stand, especially morning or afternoon um, or morning uh, bedding area stands where you're trying to sneak in, be very quiet. You make one metallic ting or some kind of noise scratching against a tree, 
in a 40 acre woodlot, you can spook the entire 40 acre woodlot out pretty quick. And so while I think tree saddles are a great idea on public land, um, maybe run and gun private land where you have that option. But here we have set food sources, bedding areas, water holes, travel corridors, mock scrapes. We're lining everything up so that we know where the deer are traveling and we want those stands in place sometime in spring, cleared up during the summer, so that we go into that for the first time to sit in the fall. It's ready to go and we can sneak as quietly as we can and slowly into that stand without making one peep. I don't even want to sit at the base of the stand and put clothing on. I want to get to the stand, step on the, the ladder, climb in, steps, whatever it might be, and get into that stand and sit down and shut up. So I don't want to actually leave any scent down at the base. I don't want to leave scent down at the base by putting anything else on. doesn't matter if it's a tree saddle or changing my clothes. I want to get up to the stand, then I'll put some more clothes on or change or do what I have to. I don't want to even leave that at the base because you take a mature buck coming in one time. Let's say you get out at 6 o'clock at night, it's dark. He comes through at 7.30, smells this big scent bank that you left right at the base of your tree. He's not coming back. That scent impression that it leaves on him is going to be a leave a very bad impression, even if it's after dark, and uh, he's not going to come back to that for two or three weeks. So you can ruin a hunt by leaving a lot of scent around your base for weeks to come, especially on a mature buck, just by fiddling around too much, let alone the noise that it takes for a climber stand, for example, on, on private land. So I only have preset stands, and people can debate about that whether you want, but you know I think the level of success we've had hunting speaks for itself, and a lot of that is because... We have predetermined set locations of stands. We sneak in, we sneak out, and we try not to let the deer know that we've been there hunting. And that's going to be the best take for you too. Now, I'm not saying you can't use a tree saddle very, very quietly, but I want to have 26 sets on our 245 acres. That includes blinds. We have nine on the 40 acres, and I might be missing one in there. But bottom line is I want those all set and ready to go. Lanes cleared sometime in the summer so that we're ready for a great hunt this fall. And again, not a certain number of stands per acre, but these concepts right here, what is critically important because the number of stands per acre, how many AM, how many PM, how many tweeners do you have? They follow a common concept of letting you know if you have a successful property design, which will ultimately lead to a great hunt and enjoyable hunt this season and beyond. Now, I don't know if you've checked out our main website lately, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com, but we've really had a lot going on, including hats, books, our web class, and certainly our new seed company, WHS Wildlife Blends. When you click on seed on our site, it'll take you right to our brand new site for the seed company. We have all 12 blends available. So check it all out, though. I encourage you. I appreciate you checking it out. Whether you buy anything or not, Really appreciate you visiting the site and uh, seeing what's going on and continue to watch because we have big things coming later this year.